Let me first say a big thank you to my dear brother Toby for the very kind invitation to join you at this 2022 Group Germans Forum. It's a real pleasure to be with you this evening and to be with you all this evening. Uh, I would like to check, just to be sure, uh, how young people are you know, in the audience. And I'd like to just find out how young uh, you are here and how current you are with some of the more popular music. Who, who, who knows this particular one? Uh, I, 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 let me first be sure that it's in, well, I see a few young looking people. They might just know. Batman looking good. <laughs> Batman looking good in the young. Batman drip to the core. How many of you know that song? How many of you know that song? No, raise your hand if you know this song. Just raise your hand. We know those, we know the, we know the young people here. I uh, can see all the old people, they don't even know what they're talking about. I mean, you guys really have to, you know, move up, move up, move up, move up. Thank you very much. Uh, we will, I, I, I want to just say again that it's a real pleasure to be here. I've been asked to speak uh, for uh, a few minutes on this topic, uh, digitization, the COP26 and African development. And um, I'm sure that um, several of us who are here recognize, of course, that those are two important uh, topics uh, all, yeah, that would shape the future of our, of our continent. And I think that really, if we start with digitization, you know, there is no question at all that digitization will, and of course uh, climate change, will determine to a large extent Africa's growth trajectory in the next few decades. At least there are those two issues, digitization and climate change. Digital technology for one offers the most effective way for Africa to leapfrog uh, development. Already the basic indicators are there and they look quite good. Africa's total inbound international internet bandwidth capacity increased by in the past decade more than 50 times. The operational fiber optic network extended by almost four times. Mobile telephony, mobile cellular subscriptions are more than doubled. And about 58% of the population now live in areas that are covered by 4G networks. Africa has over 480 million mobile money accounts, more than any other development region sticking together. And more than 500 African companies provide already technology and enabled innovation, the so called fintech companies. The valuation of some of our African startups exceeds several billion US dollars. We in Nigeria have six uh, unicorns, companies, fintech companies, most of them that are valued at over a billion dollars. We have over 640 tech hubs across the continent. And here in Nigeria, we're already leveraging digital technology in various ways, especially for government, to deliver goods and social services. To implement our social investment program, for example, we have a program called the Empower Program, where we engaged about 500,000 young graduates. A digital company, a local digital company, very young Nigerians, built the entire platform, robust enough to take and vet applications from millions of, uh, of applicants and conduct tests and make monthly payments in every local government in the country. And this is locally developed and entirely by young Nigerians. <laughs> then two weeks ago, we commissioned the Bank of Industries Growth Platform. This is a digital platform that has won international awards for delivering the largest microcredit scheme in Africa. Uh, uh, it's called the Government Empowerment and Enterprises Program. Under it, we have the Trader Money Scheme. And this is a scheme that uh, involved giving microcredit to about 2.4 million informal traders. Now, that platform engages about 22,000 agents living across all the local government in Nigeria. 
equipped with proprietary mobile technologies. They receive mandates to capture and digi uh, digitize businesses eligible for growing for a very large number of different programs of the Bank of Industry, a lot of them tied to microcredit. In some cases, these agents, these 32,000 agents, some of them are called human banks, opened the first ever bank account or mobile wallet used in many of these micro enterprises. Every detail of each of these businesses is trackable centrally down to bio data, geolocation, images, facial IDs, of every micro and small and medium entrepreneur where I think it. So we've been able to use technology for the first time in so many of these ways. And, and, and it's, been, it's been particularly intriguing because here we have a situation where in the past it would have been impossible for us to reach all of these various places and be quickly, efficiently. But that is being done uh, today. In our Food for Jobs program under Economic Sustainability Plan, we've reached digitally and mapped over 4 million farmers and geotagged them to their farms. So this enables us to reach them more easily with government services and uh, it also makes it easier to give them loans and ensure repayment. Repayment, of course, has been a major problem with giving agri-loans, especially to small farmers. Part of the reason, of course, is that it's very difficult to find, to locate them, where are they, where is their land, and all of that. But now we have at least four million of them geotyped to their land, so we know exactly where they are, we know exactly where they are, and so it, it makes it so much easier to be able to deliver services to them and at the same time uh, get credit to them. Digital companies, of course, also I'm sure many of us are familiar with this, are opening up opportunities in every line of business. And I'm sure that sometimes, you know, uh, you bankers must get a bit uncomfortable with some of these companies. Who well, Kia Kia, for example, a small company using artificial intelligence and algorithms to process loans, uh, lay loan requests within minutes, and grant credit without the hassles, you know, of the regular company. Or Kuda Bank, I'm sure you've heard of Kuda Bank. That's another example of a bank without a single physical branch, with all the features built into a mobile app. We also have, I'm sure we've heard of Invest Bamboo for those who, and I know that a good number of young people use it for investments. 26 year old was the one who, uh, who pioneered that particular application. It offers new ways for you to save money, invest in stocks all from a single app. Others have developed technologies that make it possible for us to invest in farms without ever seeing the farm. Thrive and Rick Farm Crowding, these are two companies that do exactly that. They allow, they, 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 they have a crowdfunding platform, so you can actually invest in farming and agriculture without ever uh, seeing the banks only get uh, dividends you know, at the end of every cycle. So there's so much uh, that's going on. Uh, and you'll find that this, the, the, the space is widening. But the challenge for us in the next few years is how to effectively use digital technology for mass education and for healthcare. That is a major challenge. So the question then is, I mean, so we have a population that's growing at five million, uh, five million people every year. Now that's uh, just to get a sense of the size. Liberia has about five million people, so that's like creating five million. That that's like creating a Liberia every single year. And with all of the implications for education, all of the implications for uh, for healthcare. So beyond uh, you know, uh, deep, beyond all of these, all of the successes we see, we need to be able to educate large numbers of people train teachers, and that's, very, that, that's, that's proving to be a major issue in all of the, especially in states where we have a large number of out of school children. But those challenges are the sorts of challenges that we're sitting down to look at. How do we train large numbers of teachers? And you can't, we are not going to be able to train them in colleges of education, but it's, there's just no space to be able to do so. So we've got to do it online. It's, this has to be technology driven. And that really, those are the sorts of challenges. How about healthcare, you know, public healthcare? COVID 19 showed us you know, uh, that we have a robust healthcare system. And this is because we, we have a lot of experience. 
our experience with uh, with um, uh, with Ebola. We have experience with lots of fever, yellow fever, etc. So mass vaccinations and all of that are things that we've done very, very well. So we have a robust enough system, but the, the, the issue is that there are just millions, millions and millions of people out there in the news and crimes. So technology must play a role. Technology must play an increasing part in our abilities to be able to reach our populations uh, everywhere where they may be. So the future uh, is, uh, especially for digital, uh, for digital technologies for us, is one that we just have to take on from from the very beginning, and we've got to look at it and see what we need to do. What are the things that we need to do? A lot of thinking is going on. Uh, imagine, uh, imagine uh, com uh, where we, com where we co uh, convened a major conference to look at all of these issues, especially as they relate to technology. It's something we've done internally within the public service to look at how to imagine as it were the future of the digital technology and what we need to do. And there's so many uh, different aspects of that, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to bore you or take your, your time too much on that uh, this evening. So we'll just go on to the other issue, and that's uh, the question of um, COP26 and um, climate change. Of course, we all know that COP26 is that conference that was uh, celebrated all over the world, uh, where we expected that the world would come to some conclusions as to how to ensure net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Most people seem to agree that by 2050 we should have uh, net zero carbon emissions. And most of the world, especially the wealthier countries of the world, of course, accept that by 2050 there should be some, uh, we should have, uh, we should be able to achieve the target set in Paris at the Climate Change Conference in uh, earlier on. Now, the question for us in Africa is slightly different from those of wealthier countries. The question for us is not just about climate change. We know that we have an existential crisis. The climate crisis is a major crisis. We know that this is something we've got to look out for. But for us in Africa, it goes beyond that. We have a different type of crisis also, and that is the crisis of extreme poverty. So for us, it's climate change, it's climate change as well as extreme poverty. And extreme poverty is important to us, especially, and, and the way it relates to climate change is that it is tied to energy poverty as well. It's tied to access to energy for us. So for, for an African country, for Nigeria, for example, it's important for us to take into account the fact that Yes, we want net zero emissions by 2050, but in transitioning to net zero emissions by 2050, we have to take into account that even today, we don't have enough energy. We don't have enough power. Most of our, you know, most of our, of our population do not have access to power. Now, the rest of the world, in transiting to uh, net zero by 2050, want to ban fossil fuels. In other words, they say, we're no longer going to use charcoal, which is understandable, but we're also not going to use oil and gas. We're not going to fund oil and gas projects anymore because, obviously, these are pollutants. They are not the worst, especially gas. Gas is much cleaner than most fossil fuels anyway. But for most of the wealthier countries of the world, they would rather see a situation where at least public investments in fossil fuels are no longer uh, are no longer made available. So the African country has a dilemma. Yes, we want climate change. We want uh, we want uh, net zero uh, by 2050. In our case, 2060. Well, how are we going to transit from where we are, and at the same time? be able to provide power for our people. Our country, for example, has huge gas reserves. We know that the transition fuel for us is gas. The only way by which you can power industry is to use gas. 
in, for, for, for power. So if you say you're not going to uh, invest again, and you're not going to invest in oil and gas anymore, it means that uh, we're going to have to re rely on renewable energy. Now, no country in the world so far has been, been able to industrialize using renewable energy. So what the rest of the world is telling us, perhaps, is that uh, we should be the experimental uh, continent that will industrialize using renewable energy. But that, obviously, is a far from me to, to try to do. We simply cannot do so, and we know that that's not possible. So the point that we have been making, and those of us from uh, African countries and the developing world, is that we require gas as a transition fuel, and that, and that it is important for us, not just for industry, but also to be able to ensure that we are able to move from firewood and all sorts of pollutants in cooking. So we want to move also to clean cooking. Clean cooking can only be done with, L with LPG, which, which is gas. And so if we are going to transit from firewood and all sorts of other pollutants, then we need LPG, we need gas to be able to do so. So for us, it's not just gas for industrialization, it's also gas for clean cooking. Because clean cooking for us is one of the major pollutants that there is. And it is also a major cause of death, especially in the rural areas of, uh, of our own country, Nigeria, where we have the facts and figures, and I'm sure in many other African countries. So the, the, the whole energy transition issue for us in Nigeria, and of course in many African countries, is a nuanced one. Now we have to approach it in a nuanced way. We can't accept a situation where it is the same pathway for the wealthier countries as for African countries. We have to have a different path. So if, they, so if the wealthier countries are prepared to uh, ban fossil fuel investments, they've got to give us room to be able to continue to use our own fossil fuels, obviously for a much longer period, to allow energy access for our people and also to allow us to transit from pollutants to you know, cleaner fuels. So, so there's that. So there's that issue. But you know, sometimes what, what you tend to find is that in making the point, you know, in making that point, we also are asking, you know, because there have been some pledges have been made by some of the wealthier nations of the world, that in order for us to have this smooth transition, some money will be made available. And this was at the, at the, the Paris uh, uh, Climate Change Conference where $100 billion uh, annually was the pledge that was made uh, by uh, many of the wealthier countries of the world. Well, we haven't really come across that $100 billion in the shape or form that we'd like to see it. It hasn't really showed up. But we're expecting that that will be part of because we need to have, if the whole world is saying, let's move quickly. There are parts of the world that may not be able to do so as quickly as others, including many of the which is why these sums of money are required and will be helpful in that transition uh, to net zero emissions by 2050 and in our case uh, by 2060. So we in Nigeria have developed an energy transition plan and we're possibly the first African country to do so. Where we've looked at very closely at how to transit uh, to 2060 uh, to carbon, uh, no, uh, to, uh, net zero carbon emissions by uh, 2060. That energy transition plan is, is a fairly detailed one where we've looked at how long it will take us to transit, you know, from, uh, especially with respect to cooking fuels, where we're going to be converting cars uh, from uh, combustion engines to uh, gas run engines and all of that. And how long that will take and how much it will cost. Obviously, the cost, we're also hoping that we'll be able to get some of that cost. You know, it's about uh, outside of the business as usual spending, it's about 400 uh, billion US dollars over the period up until uh, 2016. So we're uh, looking at how to ensure that we're able to uh, make those uh, resources. So just, uh, just to conclude, I think that by and large, you know, they, for, for those of us in Africa, what it takes or what it will take for us to make the kind of progress that we need obviously requires us to be a 
as nimble as possible, to be as forward looking as possible, and also to be paying attention to the various things and the various developments that are going on all over the world. I think we already have a youth population that is way ahead just in terms of being able to use what is available, both in digital technology uh, as well as, uh, as in all of the in, in, in finance, for example, they're raising capital here and there. So we think that, uh, uh, that, that the future certainly is extremely bright. And, and my view is that unlike those who think that um, Africa, the, that the Africa century has come to an end, especially after COVID and some of the bad figures that we're looking at, I think that we've just come into our own. I think that we're going to take advantage of a lot of what we've seen, especially coming from uh, the recovery from COVID-19. And I think that we're going to see a lot, we are going to see greater growth. I, I've seen some of the uh, statistics, some of the macroeconomic figures that are coming from the IMF, but well, we always we always beat those figures. And I think we're going to do it much better. So let me thank you once again for the opportunity uh, to come and join you, and I hope that I have not uh, uh, spoiled your appetite for uh, dinner and for dessert. I'm always uh, very anxious when you are trying to give a lecture to people who have just had uh, dinner and wine. I think that you have been a very good audience. Thank you very much. Indeed.